Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our College Senior Night with Archbishop Gregory. My name is Molly Herrera, and I'm the Program Director for Campus and Young Adult Ministry here in the Archdiocese of Washington. Before we begin, we are pleased to have graduates from Gallaudet University join us tonight. If you'd like to access the ASL interpreter, please find Christina DeSalvo in the list of participants. In the top right corner of her screen, you will see three dots. Click on those dots and pin Christina's video to clearly view the ASL interpreter. Thank you, Christina, for interpreting tonight. But first, it is my privilege to welcome Archbishop Gregory. Archbishop, we are so delighted that you are here with us tonight. We know you have been incredibly busy, so we are very grateful that you are able to spend some time with us. I want to quickly go over some logistics for our time together this evening. First, if you toggle your cursor over the top right portion of our Zoom window, you can select speaker view, which will automatically show you our current speaker. While we already have questions from seniors in some of our campus ministry programs, there will be an opportunity for anyone to ask the Archbishop a question. If you have a question, please type it into the chat. Jonathan Lewis, our Assistant Secretary for Pastoral Ministry and, so and Social Concerns for the Archdiocese of Washington, will be selecting a couple of those questions to close out our time together. Archbishop, I would like to introduce you some of our gra graduating seniors from across the Archdiocese. Tonight we have with us graduates from American University, the Catholic University of America, Gallaudet University, George Washington University, Georgetown University, Howard University, St. Mary's College of Maryland, Trinity Washington University, and the University of Maryland. We also have graduates who have studied around the country and are now back home here in the Archdiocese. Archbishop Gregory, before we begin with our Q&A time, would you open us with a prayer and some words for our graduates? I'd be happy to, and, and thank you for arranging this. Um, uh, obviously, I'm, I'm speaking with young people who are much more familiar with all of the technological uh, advances and distractions that we currently enjoy. So I thank them for being a part of it and thanks for our staff and their colleagues for arranging this. Let's begin with a prayer. Obviously, we are in the month of May and during that month of May, the church throughout the world and certainly here in the United States, uh, recalls with great affection the Mother of God. So let us join our prayers with the prayer of the church and asking the Mother of God to be present with us to guide, support, and strengthen us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Gracious and loving Mother, we are your children. We know of your love for us, and we ask you to help us to love you more completely and to love one another as your son had us do. Bless the young people who are gathered here, those who have returned to their homes, those who are celebrating momentous moments in their lives. Bless them, watch over them, care for them, love them, and help them love one another through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, Molly, you're on. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Archbishop. We're going to start with our first question of the night from Hector Reynoso of Gallaudet University, and Christina is going to interpret. <clears throat> Yes, hello, thank you so much. My question is, uh, I know that many people are not Christian anymore because there is so much violence and evil in the world and even in the church. How do I respond to their question that if God is so loving, why does he allow so much evil and so many people to suffer? Hector, you put your finger on one of the great questions of, um, of believers, not just in this current environment, but always. That is, how can an all-loving, all-caring, all-compassionate Lord allow such 
pain to exist. Well, part of the way that Christians have always tried to uh, respond to that question is that God created us as free individuals, free to love him and free to love each other. And part of that freedom includes the freedom not to love him, not to love others. It is a freedom that embraces but does not create the sorrow that we currently in, in, experience. If God had created us to be programmed only to love him, he would not have created us as free human beings. He made us like himself with the opportunity to choose to love and choose not to love. Uh, Hector, your question is one that obviously uh, doesn't satisfy a lot of people because they see the pain, they experience the pain, they know the pain, they see the hurt, the sorrow, the anger, the terror, and so they want to know, do away with it, wash it away, put it away, and therefore create a world that is free from sorrow, free from pain, free from hate, free from difficulties. That kind of world would not reflect what God created because in his creation, he said, I want you to be like me, capable of great love, capable of great generosity. But the, the flip side of the coin, for Hector, is that we are capable of great sorrow and pain. Um, but Hector, your question is the same question that has baffled, confused, and may I say, put off people of faith uh, from time immemorial. Wonderful. Thank you, Archbishop. Next up, we have uh, Isabella Gonzalez from George Washington University. Hi, Archbishop Gregory. My question is, how are we supposed to find God in the day-to-day -day when we are no longer on campus with easy access to a chapel or when churches remain closed? Well, first of all, I think uh, your question is, how do you become the church wherever you are? The church is not a building, as you well know. The church is not a structure. It's not uh, it's not a, uh, uh, a presence that is apart from the people who express their faith. So as you go off, you know, you're no longer in an environment where it's safe. You're no longer in an environment where everybody sees the world as you do. You know, you are no longer in a situation where it's it's comfortable to profess your beliefs. It's at that moment that you realize that if the church has any voice, it's my voice. If the church has any vision, it's my vision. If the church has any possibility of announcing gospel values in the public forum, I've got to do it. Um, and, and so it, it's, a, it's a challenge to you, to young people, uh, to our graduates. It's the same challenge that you've already faced in many other occasions. When you were a toddler and you went off to kindergarten or preschool, one of the things that challenged you is I'm no longer with mom and dad. How am I going to be safe? How am I going to be uh, with people that love me and that I have to love? You you faced that going off to grammar school. You faced it again when you went off to high school. You faced it again when you went off to college. How do I 
how do I engage with the world that is different and unlike the world that I'm leaving? And the only way you can do it is what, with, a, with, with courage and with the capacity to jump in the deep end of the pool. Wonderful. Um, next, we have uh, Kristen Molyneux from Howard University. Hi, Archbishop. My question is, given the experiences of these months and the stay-at-home order, what changes do you foresee parishes, churches in general, having to make going forward, even after the social distancing guidelines are relaxed? Well, one of the things that I just, I'm, I'm writing my weekly column, and I'm not going to ask you how many read my weekly column. I don't want to be hurt. But my weekly column this week touches on that. Namely, the re-entry of Catholics with worship, not just Catholics, but people of faith, whatever religious community, how do we get back to normal? And it's going to be gradual. One of the things that we will have to encounter is that we're going to have to bring with us into church some of the practices that we have had to embrace. We're going to have to embrace uh, wearing masks, not being engaged in a lot of personal direct contact. Uh, it, it's not going to be a, a turnkey kind of reentry. Uh, it's going to have to happen gradually. One of the bishops that uh, I speak with, uh, who is the Archbishop of Baltimore, the bishops in the region, we have a Friday morning conference call. And he said, you know, shutting down public worship was the easy part. <laughs> Starting it up is going to be the difficult part because it's not going to be able to start up in exactly the same way as it was. I believe, to be perfectly honest, we will get back to a more expressive and engaging way of worship as we had before. But it's going to take time. And a lot of it's going to depend on how we can control this virus until people feel comfortable and to uh, until we can guarantee to the best of our ability the safety of our people it's going to be a step by step by step process absolutely okay next we have sarah rivas from the university of maryland sarah are you there it's a long way to Maryland from here. <laughs> oh, I think I see her, Jonathan. Jonathan, unmute her. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not doing my job very well. <laughs> unmute her. <laughs> this is like the raising of Lazarus. Call. Untie her and let her go free. <laughs> All right, coming. Sarah, you should be unmuted now. Or did you re-mute yourself? Oh, try now. Sarah, can you unmute yourself? Oh. I'm muted again. Oh, wait. Okay, great. No, you're, you're not. You're, free. you're a free woman, Sarah. Go for it. Thank you so much. I feel so wonderful being able to speak. <laughs> no, thank you so much for um, coming and talking with all of us. This really is a wonderful experience to be able to um, speak, speak with so many other students. Um, and my question is, what piece of advice do you have for us Catholics who and seniors who are leaving our Catholic communities here at college and now entering into a particularly um, secular workforce and a secular workforce that is now going to see a lot of struggles like struggles like economic struggles and whatnot. So what advice would you have? Well, first of all, the, the advice, Sarah, that I would say is that you're not the first young person to encounter such a, uh, a, a great challenge. Um, go back well beyond your ability to remember, but go back to the young people who were leaving schools during the height of the depression. 
or young people who were leaving schools during the height of the Second World War, or in my generation, uh, were finishing uh, with the, the uh, Vietnamese, Vietnam War raging. They were walking into an environment that was hostile. Uh, it wasn't the safe environment of home, nor the safe environment of their school. But I believe our young people have the tools and the faith. Obviously, I'm talking with young people of faith, that you have the capacity to respond generously with hope and with faith. So, and, and, and I would also suggest that don't believe that everyone you're going to encounter in the workplace, in the environment that you're moving to, is going to be hostile. Many of them are young people like yourself. They may not be Catholic. They may not be Christian. They, not be, they may not even be churchgoers, but they're going to have the same questions as you do. You know, what do I do with my life that will make a, uh, a contribution to the world? How do I feel safe in an environment that's different from the environment that I left? How do I find people who may not be just like me, but who are asking the very same questions as I am? Uh, so don't don't presume that everyone that you're going to encounter over these next couple of months are going to be hostile. They may have as many questions as you, and they may have the very same questions as you do. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to go on to our next um, student that's going to ask a question. But just a reminder, um, you can send a question for Archbishop Gregory in the chat, and Jonathan will filter through and we'll pick some to go after we finish. Um, next, we have uh, Rob Wines from American University. Hi, and uh, thank you for being here with us. Uh, my question is that many of us are trying to discern our vocation. Um, how did you discern your vocation? And what would you recommend we do to, to effectively discern our own vocation? Well, first of all, uh, Rob, uh, vocations grow on you. They're like, <laughs> they're like a, a fungus <laughs> that they're there and, you know, they need to be itched, scratched. Um, <laughs> if you're thinking about something that you can do or want to do with your life, that's usually uh, that's usually a plant that God has put there. Uh, and so, you know, don't be afraid to scratch it, to see if it relieves some of the irritation. Uh, obviously, when I was your age, getting out of college, I was think already thinking about being a priest. But some of you may be thinking about other uh, life lifestyles that would lead you into other areas of exploration. You want to make a contribution to society, uh, whether that that means that you're going to go into a a helping uh, environment. Some of you are still looking. Uh, for where God wants you to go. But don't be afraid of the itch. You know, it, it's, it's how God talks to us. Uh, in, in calling the disciples, the Lord, you know, invited people, some of whom responded quickly. Others, you know, walked away be, sad because they, they they couldn't they couldn't let go of the security that they had. Um, so, what are you thinking about? Obviously, I'm going to turn the tables. What what are you thinking about in terms of a vocational uh, possibility? Was that a hypothetical or is that? <laughs> That's a direct question, man. <laughs> Well, obviously, uh, I would say somewhere between priesthood and the married life and been juggling between those for the past five or so years. Okay. I would think 
that what you're, what you're really saying is, how can I give my life to the Lord as a loving, generous man? And those two possibilities are not in conflict. When I taught in the seminary, one of the things that I said to our young candidates in the seminary is the very same qualities that would make you a good, loving husband and father will make you a good, generous priest. That is the ability to give your life to someone, whether it be a, a young woman that you're in love with and you can create a family with, or the Lord himself that you follow his direction, his, his pattern of living. But it's the same dynamic. You want to give your life to someone, not to something, Brett, to someone. You just have to find the someone that, that is most attractive. Thank you. Oh, that was beautiful. Um, uh, finally, we have Will Bullen from St. Mary's College of Maryland. If Jonathan can find Will. Where'd you go, Will? Oh, there you are. Go for it. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency, for this awesome opportunity. Um, I'm actually the campus minister at St. Mary's College, and I'm asking on behalf of one of my students, Katie. And Katie asks, as the quarantine goes on, it gets harder and harder to remember that mass celebrated over pre-recorded YouTube videos is still the mass. So what are some suggestions for helping us to feel more connected to Mass and the Eucharist when we cannot celebrate in person? Well, first of all, uh, I celebrate, you know, I've been on live stream. I, I think I may be up for an Academy Award for <laughs> some of my live stream. I, I may be just being facetious. But the fact that live stream keeps us in touch with the readings and the liturgy of the day, but it doesn't satisfy the other component of our, our hearts, which is not just to watch Eucharist, but to be engaged in Eucharist. Uh, as a priest, when I live stream, I go to communion. But the people who are watching they, they can't go to communion. And that's very un, unsatis, uh, unsatisfying to me because as a priest, my whole, my whole job and ministry is to bring the Eucharist to people. So there's a certain dissatisfaction that I experience that I come to that moment when I should offer the host and people should be there to receive the host. So I understand from my perspective the, the uneasiness and the lack of satisfaction that people have with live streaming. And, and may I also say, I hope that dissatisfaction remains because if ever we get to the point where our people say, well, you know, I saw, you know, Father so-and-so, I saw the Archbishop on Mass, and I feel like I went to Mass. We're in dangerous trouble. Because all that live streaming can do is to remind us of what we are missing. It's, it, it's an incomplete experience of the church's faith and worship. Um, I hope, well, that, that said something. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Now we have some live questions, Archbishop. First, we're going to go to James Zangi from American University. Hello, James. Where are you, man? <laughs> oh, just, Molly, if you just want to ask the question. Oh, sure. Okay. Um, James says, uh, hello, I have a question. What are some of the silver linings or glimmers of hope that you have seen or heard from this crisis? Well, uh, some of the, uh, the, the, the signs of hope 
is that our people are growing impatient. I get, I get, as you well imagine, a lot of communications, emails, letters, open it up, let us come to mass, uh, let us take a chance. Uh, and I think that's, that's a sign of the faith of our church. That's a sign of the faith of the people of this local church. And, and believe me, it's not just the Archdiocese of Washington. It's, you know, every bishop has his list of letters and emails and texts that say, when are you guys going to let us come back to church? As though it's a personal prohibition. Uh, that's a sign of the faith of of, of our church. I would be very disappointed if in a given week I received no inquiries about when mass was going to start again, because that would be an indication that people had lost their desire. And if anything, I hope this um, pandemic uh, sparks the desire even more intensely. Great. Um, next, we have a question from Nick at the University of Maryland. What is your advice to young people who see a failure of civil and political leadership to address the pending climate catastrophe? And how can we use Laudato Si and Querida Amazonia as inspiration? Well, first of all, uh, this afternoon, I just gave an interview uh, with uh, a reporter from the NCR uh, to talk about Laudato Si. And as you may know, the Holy Father, uh, in offering and in, in, in issuing that statement, really issued a challenge uh, to the whole world. Laudato Si was not a Catholic document. It was Catholic in so far it was as it was issued by the Roman pontiff. It was Catholic so far that it, it was based on uh, Catholic uh, social teaching, but it was a letter addressed to everyone. And in that letter, he says, look, there is one earth. We don't have a backup plan. We have one earth. It belongs to all of us, no matter where we live, no matter what our religious tradition is. And if we don't work together, we're all going to goof up the one plan that God gave us, which says that you are entrusted with this creation. It's, in, it's given to you to be cared for and handed on to the next generation, to your children and your grandchildren. And if you, if you blow it, we don't have a backup plan. Awesome. Um, next, we have uh, Sarah who asked, some of us have learned over these past few years to regularly celebrate the sacraments, confession, daily mass, and adoration regularly in our lives. Do you have any recommendations for how to take a more radical step in following Christ? Well, I think you have to listen to what you're hearing in, in your prayer. The, the Lord speaks to all of us in the prayer that we offer and that we listen to in his response. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely amazed and edified by the many young people that are engaged in ad Eucharistic adoration, in sacramental celebration, and in participation at Mass. I'm edified that we have young people who take their faith seriously. And if you say, well, what do we do next? Listen. This morning, as I was offering uh, morning prayer, which I offer for this local church, I, I offer it because as the pastor of the Archdiocese of Washington, um, one of my first responsibilities is to pray for my people. And the, the word that I focused in on this morning, in this morning's prayer, was listen. I think so often 
when we pray, we think our words are the most important thing that's being uttered. But in prayer, God is also speaking to us quietly, sometimes in, in nonverbal ways, but to listen to what the Lord asks of us and then to respond generously is, is it's vitally important. That's beautiful. Um, Kevin Stoll from the University of Maryland asks, Archbishop Gregory, will you play a round of golf with Father Rob Walsh and I? Well, I played with Rob once. <laughs> we have to play. You know, I, now, I'm not a great golfer. Uh, as a matter of fact, what I do would hardly qualify for golf, but I love the game. I absolutely love the game. And I, I would play with anyone who has the patience, the time, and the opportunity to, to play. Uh, I played with Rob, and I, and I love him to death. And I've played with many of our priests. Obviously, I haven't played for a while because the weather hasn't been that cooperative. But one of the priests of the archdiocese told me, you're the first archbishop that we've ever had that played golf. And that would allow us to beat him. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, your standards are not that high, man. You didn't let me beat you that day. <laughs> oh, hey, Bravo! How are you? <laughs> But you remember we did play. I remember. I remember you, be, you beating me soundly. It wasn't uh, a pleasant experience. Come on, come on, Rob. You said obedience. That's all I remember you saying that day. Yeah. yeah. Well, I said other things, but I'm glad you didn't repeat them. I don't. I don't have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, that's amazing. Um. Okay, one last question um, from your Archbishop, and um, that's actually for me. What is your hope for the young church? What do you um, hope and want from us? I want enthusiasm from you. Uh, I, I think that the young church, uh, and I think Pope Francis has said this in probably many more uh, effective ways, the young church is filled with uh, enthusiasm for life, for uh, faith, uh, for the world in which we live. Uh, that's what I want you. I, I, don't, I don't want you to be passive. I want you to be active, engaged. I want you to be uh, a, a part of the solution of the world's problems. Um, and if if you're going to disagree, feel free to disagree. I, I, now, I'm fortunate. I have two sisters. I'm the oldest of three. And I have two sisters. And they are not at all impressed with the titles that I have. They tell me exactly what they want me to know. And they they take no a hesitation in telling me what I'm doing wrong. Uh, now, they're not of your age anymore, but they've, they've done that since they were of your age. <laughs> Molly? Yes. Um, no, I'm just taking it all, all in. Archbishop, this has been such an incredible um, time that we've been able to spend with you, and I'm I'm just really grateful. And on behalf of all of our um, campus ministries and and students, I know um, that they are very very grateful um, for your time. Uh, just a quick word for our graduates. Um, thank you all for being here this evening. Before we close tonight, we want to make sure you know that you're not alone in this journey of faith, especially after college. Uh, this summer, we will be holding small groups for graduating seniors who are navigating life and faith in the real world. If you are interested in connecting to a community of young adults after college at a parish or being a part of a small group with other recent graduates, please follow us on social media at DC Catholic. You can also sign up for our weekly DC Catholic newsletter by texting DC Catholic to 84576. 
Before we close our time together, Archbishop, would you give our graduates a blessing? First of all, I, I certainly would. And uh, I'm, I'm delighted that Father Rob is on this phone call, uh, not just to uh, chide, chide him or chide or, or re reflect on um, uh, our golf experience, but Rob represents uh, some of the wonderful ministry that our priests offer to young people in the college age community. He's not alone. Uh, and, and it's obviously not something that only priests do, but uh, Rob loves the young people and has served them quite well and produced a lot of vocations, Robert Wines. He, he, he's, on, he's on the vocation trail. Okay, let us pray. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty Father, you are lavish in bestowing all of your gifts. And we thank you and we give you thanks for the favors that you have given to us. In your goodness, you have favored us and kept us safe in our past. We ask that you continue to protect us, all of our young people and graduates, and to shelter them in the shadow of your wings. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, descend upon all of our young people, their ministers, their families, their friends, and remain with them forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you again, Archbishop Gregory, for being with us. Um, thank you. We have all of our um, campus ministry staff and chaplains here with us again tonight. Thank you all for everything that you do. None of this would be possible uh, without you. Um, and graduates, congratulations to each of you, and we hope you have a wonderful evening. Good night, everyone. Good night. God bless.